now to this breaker. Let's start again. So <laughs> I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, breakout session, Building a Health Shield. Uh, my name is Andreas Solvok. I'm uh, assigned with uh, the Climate Service Center Germany at Herion and also working in the Climate Europe 2 pro, uh, program project. And uh, I'm co-chairing this session together with my colleague Ines Martin uh, from uh, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Uh, she's also in Climate Europe 2, but also in the one of the projects we are highlighting this afternoon, the ID Alert, uh, when I understood this correctly. Um, so um, we uh, share our, uh, the, the presentations here uh, jointly. Um, um, with you, and uh, we have a number of uh, uh, distinguished speakers this afternoon presenting us um, some aspects of uh, climate change and health, which was uh, an emerging field, a field over the past years uh, with respect to climate services. Um, so uh, uh, we see more and more the the impact of climate change on health. This has various aspects, and uh, I'm really happy to have a couple of experts here. I'm not at all an expert in health, um, so don't ask me anything about that. Um, but uh, we have a number of experts here who uh, could give us a little bit of an insight about um, the issues that we have uh, with respect to uh, climate change and health. Um, yeah, before perhaps we start, uh, as in the previous sessions, please, please if you don't um, uh, speak, please uh, keep your mics muted. And uh, uh, for those who are not presenting, uh, please keep your uh, video cameras off unless uh, you want to place a, a questions. You could do this either in the chat or later on raising your hands as, as normal. And before we come to the first speaker, I just hand over to Ines, who has some uh, questions for you. I prefer the multimeter, just to get to know a little bit more the audience of this of this room. Uh, I will share first a slide that will get you to the to the right multimeter. You can scan this QR or go directly to the link. I think that. Somebody can sharing that on the on the chat. And am I right? Mm -mm. Well, or I will I will myself share it on the chat. I was not so fast in it, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So you go there, you uh, you will find this question on a Mentimeter, just to get to know you a little bit. So in what areas do you consider yourself an expert? There are different areas. You can choose more than one in case you consider yourself an expert in more than one or three. So, so far we have mostly climate science, uh, science experts and environmental science experts. And I will change to the next one which is from these aspects, uh, what do you think that they are the major risks with respect to climate change and health? You can choose up to three of these options. Okay, two people agree, <laughs> three people agree. So most people seem to agree that increased stress in healthcare systems, injuries and deaths from extreme weather and heat related illnesses are going to be the major risks, followed by the mental and psychological impacts. 
Okay, so maybe we can continue after this short break. Maybe we can continue with our presentation. I hand over to you, Andreas. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, perhaps we can show the, the results, uh, the final results some at some point. Um, but uh, yeah, let me first introduce the first speaker, uh, which is Peter Hoffmann. Peter is uh, a staff member here at Jerix in uh, Hamburg. And uh, uh, he is leading a, a junior research group, uh, COSIN Health, uh, it's, it's called Conflicts. Um, um, and synergies between carbon neutral and healthy city scenarios uh, that he is uh, um, heading. And uh, um, he will uh, present us uh, something uh, about closing the gap between mitigation, adaptation, and health by creating integrative climate services. The floor is yours, Peter. Yeah, thanks uh, also again uh, to uh, like uh, uh, to the organizers um, for the invitation. So it's really interesting um, lineup. So I will um, yeah talk. Uh, you already saw the title, so I go straight into what I'm going to present now. Is like we're talking about oh it's not working. Let's see um, about climate change and urban health in in my case because we're looking at cities. And here's just like one big overview really nicely by the National Center of Environmental Health, um, like the impacts of the multiple climate uh, change uh, changes on the health of the human. Um, and there is like a multitude, you have extreme heat, severe weather, air pollution, uh, like turbine diseases and so on. So my focus is more on the side of uh, extreme heat in, uh, in cities and uh, therefore like heat related illnesses, death, cardiovascular diseases, but there's also some impacts that are beyond this like um, uh, these diseases, which we can look at. But cities are of course not just doing nothing in, in, in light of like, climate change because they're actually trying to tackle this problem by by uh, first of all, uh, at, um, have uh, like climate mitigation plans. That means like cities are accounting for roughly seventy percent of the uh, global CO two emissions. So there's a huge potential for uh, climate mitigation in cities. And there there are some actions that are proposed that go for emission reductions through, for instance, lifestyle changes, which we an have analyzed. And this is more like go going from a city on the on um, on the left to more or less like with lots of cars centered to more like a city with bike and walking. Um, and on the other hand, like cities are also and their populations are vulnerable to climate change. And so they're adapting to it. And for instance, uh, uh, in order to uh, reduce the health impacts of these climate changes, and these are mainly changes to buildings and build structures so, and morphology. And one really nice example, so, <laughs> sort of like a unsealing of parking lots. That's just like something which I always like to highlight. But then there's uh, between these two climate actions, there are actually uh, there can be synergies. And like I brought you here an example for urban greening. Uh, which adds to like the CO2 storage of cities. So to some extent, they can compensate CO2 emissions uh, from the cities, um, this urban green. And so there's, it's one step towards carbon neutralities of cities. So it's not the main one, but, but still uh, it can have uh, like a positive impact. And on the other hand, uh, urban greening is heavily used in, in, in climate adaptation in order to reduce temperatures and, uh, and provide shade. And so um, the daytime and the nighttime heat stress is actually reduced. And so it's really an adaptation measure for uh, future heat extremes. So there's clear synergies between these climate actions, um, um, also respect to, with respect to health. But here's another example, like where you have, uh, for instance, uh, the plan to have compact cities in order to reduce the commuting and enable the switch to cycling and walking. We in Germany we call that city of short distances, Stadt der Kurzen Wege. And therefore you reduce, of course, the traffic related CO2 emissions, and you can improve the health through more exercises and reduced air pollution. On the other hand, for climate adaptation, it's actually like, at least in the middle latitude cities, it's more like you should avoid actually like in the narrow street canyons and instead have like like a bit more loose um, 
and like a lower density in this case in order to reduce the so-called urban heat island effect. Um, that's sort of for the nighttime heat stress. And so they, like you see here, there's a clear conflict. So it's not clear which effect is larger, but there could be a conflicting goal, especially with respect to health in this case. Um, and this small example just shows that synergies and trade-offs between climate mitigation and adaptation should be considered when planning healthy cities. And so that's what we are trying to do in, uh, in this uh, COSIN uh, health project uh, in, the, in this group. So we have a city, the present city. There are a few different scenarios for the city. We have carbon neutral uh, scenarios. We have uh, healthy city scenarios. So there can be, between these scenarios, there can be conflicts. And um, we're trying to like um, help cities uh, in um, trying to increase the synergies and uh, avoid these trade-offs by uh, developing climate service tools that are based on an urban system approach. And this urban system does not just consist of like this uh, the urban climate, but also the urban morphology, the peoples that are living in their, their individual behavior, their mobility, lifestyle and so on. And all of these have an effect on the urban health. And by considering these complex interactions um, and then developing climate services, we're trying then to um, develop tra transformation scenarios together then with the stakeholders. And of course, like we have both climate change that is impacting the cities and there's also a big um, sort of external pressures, so, uh, demographic changes, which should be also considered when doing this. And so just when I'm talking about model and like these climate service tools, um, I'm talking about model based climate services. Um, here there's like we start with um, the like the impact uh, of climate change on the heat stress by analyzing uh, the biometrological conditions using regional climate model data and then also um, develop methods in order to refine these um, simulations with on a really high resolution in order to get really the the heat stress on a neighborhood level. And then, of course, we have to link this to, to health, which is not, not trivial. We're collaborating here with uh, people, uh, um, scientists from uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And then um, we also, these modeling tools, then they, they have this advantage in, uh, that we can actually implement the mitigation and adaptation measures and see what kind of effect this has on the, uh, on the future heat stress. Uh, but as I said, it's only one part of the um, like urban climate and the urban morphology is just one part of the urban system. And the other one is sort of the individuals and the society. And in order to, uh, and therefore, we develop an agent-based modeling system that um, simulates the exposure of the different population groups to this heat stress using the output from the urban climate simulations. And by this, we can actually... Um, investigate how changes, how behavioral changes, for instance, the 1.5 degree lifestyles, like actually have, have an impact on, on the exposure to the heat stress. So are they actually beneficial? Like if you go out and doing a really uh, um, um, hot day, it's maybe not good to, to ride your bike. Instead, it's better to um, have a um, air conditioned uh, public transport. And um, yeah, and this with this, as I said, we can uh, investigate the, the heat stress, uh, exposure to heat stress as a function of lifestyle, and also see if the adaptation measures which we had in these previous um, modeling uh, approach in the urban climate model, how does it actually affect the exposure of the people? And then, um, of course, this is uh, not something you can show to <laughs> directly uh, to stakeholders. Um, we are actually trying to, to develop, like uh, co-develop these climate service tools by integrating, um, as I said, this urban climate modeling and agent-based modeling in, in, in uh, collaboration and co-development with uh, the relevant stakeholders. And then also uh, with the health stakeholders and with our health experts develop a methodology for the health assessment, uh, health risk assessment. And in doing so, we can actually identify then the synergies and uh, conflicts between climate mitigation and adaptation with respect to uh, health. 
And um, we apply these uh, tools then uh, in a participatory scenario workshops, uh, including a so-called imaginary future generation. So I don't go into this, but it's also really interesting um, um, participatory modeling approach. And then in the end, hopefully we'll can we'll support then uh, to developing these scenarios, which then have uh, lower the uh, trade-offs and increase the conflicts uh, synergies. Sorry, uh, between um, these measures. And just uh, as like a, a cause and health to go, I, I call it like what are we going to do? We're connecting climate mitigation and adaptation with urban health. Um, we're integrating. Uh, different modeling approaches in order to quantify the synergies and the con conflicts between this uh, climate mitigation and adaptation. And uh, we co-develop and apply climate services in, in scenario workshops. Yeah, and this is just like, uh, I would like to thank you uh, for your attention and looking forward to any questions or discussions afterwards regarding yeah, this interesting topic. Yeah, thanks very much, Peter, this, uh, for this insight and uh, introduction into the, the problem of uh, climate change and health. Um, just one question which came uh, up uh, to me when I listened to you, you, you talked about the, the co-development um, mm -hmm. and uh, your stakeholders. Uh, just concrete, uh, who uh, whom are you talking to? How are you just these uh, people or who are experts in uh, in health and medicine, or are these yeah. people uh, on yeah. the street? Or... Yeah, no, no, no. That, that, that's a good point. <laughs> I haven't mentioned that. Sorry. Um, first of all, like uh, we um, talk, of course, to urban planners. That's that's uh, that we are already in contact with, uh, like as uh, city officials of a. Um, district here in Hamburg, then, but also to the people in um, and the health department. So there's some there, there's a a bit of a disconnect between like adaptation and mitigation uh, um, people and the health. So we are talking to all of these stakeholders, but on this sort of uh, administrative level, and we are like uh, participating um, in different. Um, so we're doing these interviews with them and also um, like uh, defining the regions where we conduct the, uh, the simulations and so on. But we also are involved in like uh, participating in the development of the heat action plan, which we are, um, which Hamburg just developed. And so there we have like, um, of course, like we didn't write them, but but sort of as a as an expert. And so we got really nice feedback in order to see, okay, what's actually planned, what's what's actually a, like like the application uh, side so so because it's nice to see what uh, like uh, what what's the proposal for um like uh, any adaptation measures and to see what's actually implemented and this is what we're currently doing like these two things speaking to them but also joining certain processes in the yeah, yeah. in the like city Thank you, everyone. This is this is quite interesting because this is also you could also uh, uh, push it under the uh, cities and climate change. So it's uh, cities and health is uh, somehow interconnected, and uh, so this is also a, a topic which uh, is has is very much related to urban development. And uh, so you we you're not just talking to uh, now the the health sector, but you're also talking to uh, the um, development urban development and uh, cities uh, experts uh, to really touch on this uh, this issue yeah. these issues yeah. so yeah uh, i think we have to move on so thank you for, for the moment peter first we come back to in the in the discussion uh, later on and i would like to move on to uh, you ting wang lachman uh, who uh, is also a staff member here at jerix and she's also leading a uh, a BMBF-funded uh, junior research group uh, started at the same time as uh, as Peter, uh, but with a different focus. So, so uh, her focus is uh, co-creating climate services for care economy and caring society, and what is um, the purpose and uh, the background for uh, for this project. She will explain us uh, in a minute. Um, so. Uh, your thing, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Andreas, for your um, introduction. So I'm Rotin von Wachmann. I'm uh, leading a junior research group on Co-Care Society. And that's what I'm going to share with you, what we do with this co-creating climate services for care economy and caring society. So, so should be able to change myself. So um, we have been observing the, the societal needs. And this is what we observe is that first we saw the, the climate uh, change. And from, from our research center, Climate Service Center Germany, we already have uh, throughout the whole Germany and also worldwide we have this regional modeling. We already saw the result of the changing climate um, and, and climate projection until end of the century. And at the same time, we see that um, different developed uh, countries, they are uh, facing the aging society. Then the uh, population pyramid is changing. And so will the uh, developing world, they will also face the same issue. And uh, through the energy crisis, the, a lot of the energy bills, especially for the social economic group, the vulnerable group, their energy bills are going up, no matter for cooling or for heating. And this is what we see that this challenge and all together will actually continue to worsen in the, uh, in the next few decades. And this is our motivation that we observe the societal challenges and how we are going to take all these three topics together. And therefore, that I wrote a proposal and I got a funding from the German Federal Ministry of Education Research to establish a group. And we are a group that we promised to bring together the, the three topics, together, climate change, uh, long-term care, and the aging society, and energy, the three topics together. And our goal is to uh, co-create a climate service to bring in this long-term perspective, the long-term demographic change, climate change, and future energy demand, and the future way of living and well-being of the, the, the human being. And we gain, we aim to bring in also the WNO and U, uh, UNSDG um, and IPCC goals together. Um, we you will see through my slides today that I will also engage, uh, show you how we engage a societal stakeholder, especially the, the, the users from our climate services. Um, uh, our aims to produce something that can be used for the society. And yesterday uh, I got invited uh, uh, to talk about how the national project uh, funded in Germany can contribute the EU mission adaptation to climate change. So, 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 so this will also link to the, to the EU project and EU mission as well. And I'm not alone, I have a wonderful team. So I show you um, the, the picture of my, my professional team who we are working together. And I also have international partners. So we work with Japan and and, and um, Taiwan to get the health data to observe the health outcome of the heat wave. We also work with the United Kingdom as well as USA to see how different care systems and how this uh, is uh, have influence on the climate and, and health risk. And we are working with two um, uh, global South countries, so Uganda and Senegal, to see whether there are some mutual lessons can be learned, transferability, um, that, that's uh, the setting. And our main idea is to look at first the interconnection of these three topics. What, how, what, how are the risks? How are the opportunities connected? The three topics, climate change, health, and energy. And then to from this understanding to see how do we create synergies of these three nexus and how the future uh, living will be compatible with these three topics together. So these are our research uh, questions. And we have a different method. We have the data analysis and we have this um, demonstrate, demonstrator or we call it called care labs in our case study and citizen science. And today I'm going to give you two concrete examples how we call pre uh, climate services with our narrative approach and as well as how we conduct our data analysis such as policy experiment together with our uh, core care labs or living labs you can also call them so um we learn that there are more climate change and health studies that are published through the systematic literature re review. But at the same time, we also saw the gap that a lot of global South countries, especially health experts, they have a lot of practical experience that is not being cited or being published on the, on the uh, literature review le level. So their experience and their, their a lot of first-hand experience, they are not being included in the, in the global literature published in English. So we designed a workshop that we conduct in Global South and Global North 
to to invite energy and health experts um, and also climate expert to to through our co design workshop to give us their hands on experience. And basically, we want to find out what exactly are the interconnection of these topics, climate change and climate extremes, energy, long-term care and health, and their nexus. And this is the um, uh, uh, our result. We already published it. I would like to invite you to read in, uh, to this paper. Um, so in our result, we found that um, all the, for example, expenditure, additional costs, and this financial burden and the health burden are all linked to climate extremes, especially related to temperature, like heat wave or cold wave. So this is a very, um, this is a, the, the finding that we found that, that they are all interlinked, but the strongest link, no matter internal connection, interconnection or external, they are all linked to uh, temperature related uh, climate extremes. And we, with this result, that we identify different level of active stakeholders. We have an individual level. So in Germany, we we uh, include the the let's say active uh, senior group that they meet up every week to do exercise. We engage them, and we have also the community uh, community level. They're like a senior citizen board. They meet up to to lay out the policy at the local level, and then we also um, uh, cooperate with the care institutions. Um, and and then also the 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 health ministries. So these are our our uh, level of the coquillas, and they are basically the active stakeholders from the society that we continuously throughout these five years, from the beginning and also throughout this process, we engage them, and then we 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 show them the the information, and then we want to see whether these are effective, and we observe whether they have behavior change, and how do we combine this data analysis together with the user's response. So for example, the 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 heat wave, then how then, for example, how are those um, elderly uh, people they are exposed? So we we interview and we observe how they um, engage their outdoor activity in which hour they are in, and then which of the let's say vulnerable group they are especially vulnerable to heat wave. And then we ask about their uh, response. How do they respond to certain behavior? Do they use electricity intense cooling measure or heating measure in some countries? And then we we see that then are there certain policy actually advocate not to overload the electricity grid? And then do you have this response and, and conflicts, uh, uh, contradictory responses sometimes. So these we include them um, in all our data analysis, how the users actually respond to these, for example, heat waves. And then um, and then from uh, our expertise, we have done literature review um, as well as um, systematic review. We found all these parameters that could be related to, to they say, to impact on the health of uh, seniors. But these are not enough. So what we did is that we co-produce these uh, together with them to, to find out with different uh, elderly group to say, okay, which parameter that you feel your comfort, thermal comfort level are higher or lower. So, so for example, maybe not just the heat wave days or uh, summer days, uh, and also tropical nights, and then also the combination of different parameters. So for example, for the old people, it's not just precipitation that will influence, the, it's the precipitation plus the frost days, they will increase their risk of slipping on the ice. So basically these are the, our approach that we identify these together with our users and bring these to our um, uh, climate modeling colleagues that they can also uh, help to produce the next generation of the, the climate effect sheet. So this is how we, how we did it in our project. And our next step is to identify these key threshold through the different regions differences because people from different age or different regions, they also have different uh, the threshold, they create the, the danger for them. So we are going to identify the th uh, threshold according to the group specifically. And then we believe uh, these are transferable also through the different age group. So the, the, the 60 and 80 plus, they can already have immediate measures 
uh, right now. And for the younger age group, they can still have the long term measures. So how are they going to renovate their house or build their house to make sure they have higher thermal comfort without using air conditioning, for example, so that they have, they have this perspective of this really long term. And that's how we did it with this co design process with them from the beginning throughout the whole process. So that's um, the snapshot of how we do. And I would like to thank the funder and please visit our website for Care Society. You can see more of our work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Yuting. That was very interesting. And uh, also that you really interact with um, the the end users, so, so to say, uh, here. Um, are you doing this just here, uh, say in Germany, Hamburg, or um, are you doing this also in other, or are you planning to do this in other regions, or are your partners uh, doing the same kind of thing to perhaps uh, explore what, what the difference is um, in, in other regions? And you mentioned the Global South or so um, are... Um, yeah. So, so thank you for the question. So we, for the prototype, so we are in the prototype process. So what you have seen um, and whether these information are effective, this prototype process, we are only doing in two case studies at the moment. So we are in, Ger uh, in Germany and then we are uh, right now cooperating with our partner in Global South, only two. But all these results, once it's proven in the prototype process, it's effective. So the communication, they're effective and then whether they can effectively reduce their health risk. Once this is already confirmed, uh, evaluated in our prototype services, we are going to translate them into five different languages and make it available on our project website. And that will be the third part, the citizen science platform that we're going to make it public available and free. And then and then hopefully then it would reach out to more regions. So in within Europe, outside of Europe. So that's our goal. That will be hopefully one year from now, we can already make everything available online. Yeah, thank thank you very much. So in, in in future, it might be more useful for elder people to invest in an AC uh, air conditioning system than in measuring the blood pressure uh, every day. Uh, so uh, uh, it's a little bit simp oversimplified, of course. But uh, uh, so we we are all facing have to face these uh, these issues, and then it's, it's very I think very important also to raise the uh, more attention also in, in the in this generation and the generations to come, uh, how to uh, preserve and protect. Yeah, um, if there are no other questions to you, Ting, um, how do you identify threshold for the elderly, elderly and children um, was a Thank question. You. So much for the question. So at the moment, we are not um, measuring the threshold for the children yet because there is not uh, our first party group, but basically the effective communication flyers as the recommendation what uh, to do, we will basically uh, make sure that it's not just given to the care institution for the senior citizen. We we'll also make sure that it's distributed to the let's say childcare institution. So that's what I meant with the children's group. So we are not trying to measure the 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 the, the difference between different group, but uh, uh, the reason why we want to identify, uh, how do we identify is that we basically, um, we have the different, um, we have right now the, the, the temperature that we know that are creating more danger from the threshold, from the literature review, but we don't know whether there are regional differences. Uh, in global South countries or in Germany, different, you know, Southern Germany or Northern Germany, that's the first one. And second group is the user experience. So, so, so uh, one person being exposed by the sun during the lunch hour outside or uh, all person are sitting at the lunch hour inside and living in different, um, different, uh, different household, different status of energy efficient ho houses. So basically that's the part of the core care labs that we are collaborating with different care institutions. And then we are um, going to do the interviews and surveys with them to, to find out their thermal comfort through the different, different temperature. So this is uh, what we're doing with the core care labs part. Yeah, thank thank you again, and I think we have to move on. And I think the next two speakers are introduced by Ines. So thank you, uh, Yuting, for this very interesting insight, and Peter as well. Uh, so now uh, I will give the floor to Kim Van Dalian. She is the postdoctoral scientist in the Global Health Resilience Group at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. 
She's also the lead author of the Lancet Canon in Europe Indicator Report and a researcher in the Idea Alert European project. And she's going to present us the work of the Lancet Countdown in Europe with her presentation title, the 2024 Euro Report of the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change, Unprecedented Warming Demands, and Unprecedented Action. Kim, the floor is yours, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ines, for the night's introduction and invitation. I'm just going to try sharing my screen. Could you just confirm that you can see my screen now? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Um, I may be a bit longer than 10 minutes, uh, so maybe we don't have time for questions, but I will do my best to go uh, through it relatively fast, but understandable. Um, in this presentation, I will talk a bit about the work that we're doing within the Lancet Countdown in Europe, as well as how that relates to ID Alert. And then one of my colleagues, Gina, will delve in a bit more uh, in some of the specific projects and things that we're doing in the ID Alert project. Um, so first I start with the Lancet Countdown in Europe. So these are two major publications that you may have seen published in 2009 and 2015, which concluded that uh, climate change is the biggest global health threat to, in the 21st century, but later on also concluded that it could be the biggest global health opportunity to the health care benefits of climate change action. And then since 2015, the Lancet Countdown has been... Um, funded. And this is an, an organization that tracks the different ways in which climate change is impacting human health, as well as the health care benefits from climate change mitigation and adaptation. So for example, by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we may also reduce air pollution and that in, um, and that in turn reduces uh, related mortality. Um, since then, we have published several reports that outline different indicators tracking climate change and health over time, and we have grown to highlight specific um, region, regional risks through the different regional centers. Um, so one of the regional centers that we have predominantly been involved in is the Lancet Countdown in Europe. And this collaboration is able to report on the final resolution. Then, for example, we would be at a global scale. This is just to highlight some of the other regional reports, which are able to focus more specifically on the climate and health risks that are relevant for uh, their regional context. To give a bit of a background, um, when we're thinking about climate change within our collaboration, we have five different working groups among which we track indicators. So when I'm talking about an indicator, I'm talking about some form of a climate and health association that we track over time. So we try to see as far as we can go back in history to a date as close to the present as possible, how these associations and how these effect estimates are changing. And we do that um, by by adapting these different indicators into five different groups, whereby the first ones are focusing on climate change impacts, exposures, and vulnerabilities. So we're looking at the climate suitability for different infectious diseases. We're looking at how wildfire smoke is impacting health. We're looking at heat-related mortality and all kinds of different impacts and exposures. And the second part is more focusing on adaptation, planning, and resilience for health. So are health systems prepared for the impacts of climate change? The third part is focusing on mitigation actions and health care benefits. So for example, in Europe, we have seen a reduction in a, a reduction in air pollution. What is that? What does that, what does that mean for health? Um, the fourth part, we're focusing on economics and finance. And then the fifth part, we're focusing on politics and government. So how do different uh, bodies engage with the health impacts of climate change? We published our very first report in 2021, followed by our first indicator report in 2022. And our last report was published uh, this year, which includes 40 different, 42 different indicators generated by 69 researchers. And these track all different aspects of climate change and health. So you can imagine that it's way too much time to go over all of these different indicators. So I highlight just a bit of the general trends, um, what we have found in our research, and then delve into some of the specific infectious diseases ones uh, as, it's as it relates to ID Alert. So this is a figure uh, that comes out of our 2022 report. Um, at the top, you can see climate-related health impact indicators, and at the bottom, you can see climate change response indicators, so things related to adaptation and mitigation. These are all standardized because, of course, all four indicators have different effect effect estimates and metrics. Um, but overall, what you can see is that for all the climate-related uh, health impacts that we are tracking, that the trends are increasing in the hazard exposures and vulnerabilities. 
and that we see some improvement in adaptation and mitigation, but that it is still far from where we would like it to be. Um, so for example, at the top, you can see some of the things that we're tracking, like physical activity related heat stress, malaria, heat related mortality. And at the bottom, you can also see that for premature mortality related to air pollution, it has slightly been improving. In our first working group, we have uh, 14 different indicators that are highlighted here. Uh, the green ones are the ones that are new uh, to the 2024 report compared to 2022. And I'm just highlighting some of the climate sensitive infectious disease ones. So this is one of our uh, indicators focusing on West Nile virus, which is a climate sensitive zoonotic pathogen, which spreads from birds to humans uh, via mosquitoes. And in Europe, the pathogen has become endoepidemic with a large increase in intensity, frequency, and geographical expansion of West Nile virus uh, occurring in more, um, more regions in Europe. Here, we used a supervised machine learning classifier on data of West Nile virus presence or absence combined with climatic data and socioeconomic predictors. And what we see is that there is a relative increase in West Nile virus outbreak risk when we compare uh, the last decade of the data with the first decade of the data. And over time, the absolute outbreak risk was highest in Eastern and Southern Europe. So that's also what we see visualized here in the graph on the right. One of our other infectious disease indicators is focusing on leishmaniasis. So leishmaniasis is also a climate sensitive zoonotic disease caused by the leishmaniasis parasite and transmitted by female sandflies. Um, sandfly species tend to be located in regions with periodic temperatures that are above uh, 15 degrees, um, but the climatic conditions differ a bit depending on the different um, parasites developments and species. In a future climate change, we also expect that many sensitive species are uh, expected to further expand their range in Europe. And in this indicator, we use a nested machine learning approach um, to predict the climatic suitability for leishmaniasis across the different nuts tree regions, so across different administrative units uh, within Europe. If you look at the figure here on the right, we see the areas that were only suitable in the first part of the of the data, 2001 to 2010, in the most lightest uh, of pink. You can see that a bit in, um, for example, Turkey, and then the 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 bit that's a bit more pink of suitable in both areas. But the ones that are uh, most pink were uh, only suitable in uh, the latest part of the data. So we see that there are new localities that are becoming climatically suitable for the spread of leishmaniasis north of where it was previously suitable. And we see that it is also spreading uh, further on, uh, north from the endemic zone. zone. So when we look at the countries that have a blue line surrounding them, that are the countries that that uh, were historically endemic, but we now see that there are more suitable areas going upwards in Northern Europe. One of our other uh, climate climatic suitability indicators is focusing on ticks. Um, you may know that although there are multiple tick species that are associated with the transmission of pathogens, uh, Ixodiacus reticus, which I don't pronounce correctly, um, but Ixodiacus reticus ticks uh, is the predominant European factor that we find in Europe. Um, and that can, among others, transmit things like Lyme disease and tick-borne encephalitis. Um, in this indicator, we used a threshold-based approach to estimate the number of months with optimal conditions. And when we look at the figure here again on the right, we see that there has been an increase in the amount of nuts tree regions that are showing climatic suitability um, when we compare the last decade of the data with the first decade of the data. And Eastern Europe and Western Asia show most substantial increases in the months suitable, particularly in rural areas and areas with high deprivation. Overall, when we look at the conclusions of our report over all these 42 different indicators, of which I was only able to highlight three of them, we emphasize that climate change is already happening also in Europe, and it is not a far in the future scenario. We also emphasize that many European countries remain major contributions contributors to greenhouse gas emissions, and that they also still provide net fossil fuel subsidies despite the health harms of climate change, and that the failure to take decisive action may exacerbate the existing climate change impacts and lead to missed opportunities for considerable health co-benefits in the short term. 
You can find our data online on the European Climate and Health Observatory, which is managed by the European Commission. We have also uh, contributed to various policy reports and uh, worked with different organizations to translate our findings into policy recommendations. And you can also use various uh, communication materials, which can be found on the IdeaAlert website um, to communicate uh, the findings of our different indicators. And these are all our collaborating institutions. We are with 42 at the moment, so I'm very thankful for all our uh, uh, collaborators and others that are contributing to those. And uh, this project is majorly funded by the Wellcome Trust, but also by ID Alert and Catalyze. So some of the uh, indicators that I just highlighted predominantly come out of the ID Alert project. So we'll briefly give an introduction in what we're doing in the ID Alert project, and then I will hand over, uh, I think I will hand over to Gina, who will zoom into a specific aspect of this project. So ID Alert aims to tackle the emergence and transmission of pathogens by developing a range of decision support tools and systems to enable decision makers to act on time with improved responses. We have about 19 different partners and this project is funded by the European Commission under a five-year project. Um, we know that climate change is one of the several drivers of recurrent outbreaks and the geographical range expansion of infectious diseases. That's what we just saw in some of our indicators in the Lancet countdown as well. And in ID Alert, we have proposed a framework for the co-production of policy relevant indicators and decision support tools to track both the past, present, and future climate-induced risks across hazard exposures and vulnerability domains at the animal, human, and environmental interface. And that's depicted here as well. We use the combination of the One Health concept together with the IPCC framework of risk to take our approach on how we look at climate-sensitive infectious diseases within this project. Or approach to generate or approaches to generate and transfer knowledge and research activity on hazard exposures and vulnerabilities and risks while integrated environment while integrating both the environment animal and human health so one health uh, to hopefully uh, give the give society tools to build more climate resilience health systems and our work is um, built up out of five, six different streams so the first one is focusing on the development of indicators to monitor climate sensitive infectious diseases and that is work that directly feeds into the Lancet countdown in Europe and uh, some of the indicators that I just uh, presented um, have been developed under uh, this working stream. Then our next part is focusing on the projections of infectious disease risk. So looking how under different adaptation and mitigation scenarios we can expect what type of infectious disease risk we will see. Um, then uh, the third part is focusing on seasonal predictions for targeted early warnings and response systems. Gina will talk a bit more about that. Then we also work on the evaluation of local interventions for infectious disease risk adaptation, as well as developing novel data streams for improved surveillance and uh, exploring the social determinants of health and social inequalities and vulnerable groups to make sure that we can target interventions to the most at-risk populations. Um, so these are some of the activities that we are engaged with, indicator development and early warning platforms, uh, like we have just discussed as well, the evaluation of different adaptation solutions, so for example, uh, nature-based solutions. We use uh, app-based citizen science of mosquitoes and ticks to inform us of where new mosquitoes are spreading to. Um, developed a disease projection in climate change scenarios, and we also have different capacity building activities and work on different ways to disseminate our findings. There's a range of different expected results. Um, so again, the development of innovative indicators, which have already been published in the Lancet Countdown a Year report, the development of predictive models and early warning systems, as well as tools for health impact and cost benefit assessment of climate change adaptation and mitigation measures and new knowledge on the health code benefits, as well as unintended consequences of climate change adaptation and mitigation. Because we often talk about the health code benefits, but sometimes things as nature-based solutions may have unintended consequences by uh, also increasing the suitability of the habitats for different um, factors of infectious diseases. And these are all things that need to be taken into account to make sure that we can optimize the health code benefits from climate mitigation and adaptation. And then, of course, um, developing new knowledge and society on the societal implications of climate change and health systems and the development of training materials and guidelines to elevate um, rele 
relevant actors in citizens' daily life. Kim, uh, I'm afraid we have to continue, uh, otherwise yes, we run out of time. Is... We have a sharp end uh, of this session. We can't overrun, so we have to we have to yes. move on. So um, um, this I is think last should, slide. Yeah, yeah, we should uh, we should really uh, come to an end. So we, you have another six case studies that you're performing in this. Okay. Yes, um, I was just going to say that uh, all the methods that we're developing are being tested in six case studies. And with that, I was going to end. I'm sorry I run a bit over time. I think I'm at 14 minutes. Um, I think I was told it was fine if it was within 15 minutes. But uh, thank you for the presentation. And if there are any questions, I'm looking forward to hear those in the discussion. Ines, you're muted. Sorry, thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. It was a very, inter very interesting introduction to uh, the last and count of your work and a very nice introduction to Idealet Art as well. Um, I'm going ahead with the next presenter. She is Gina Chadli. She's also a researcher in the Global Health Resilience Group at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, where she mainly works uh, on the Idealet uh, project and now have been uh, briefly presented by Kim. And Ina will talk more about the Idea Lake project and indicators that are being developed in this project under her presentation title, Subseasonal to Seasonal Indicator uh, Platform. Uh, the floor is yours, Ina. Thank you, Anas. Um, if you hear some building work, by the way, I can only apologize. We're sitting in an elevator in our building, so they're a bit noisy. Sorry. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to present um, some of the work as, that's part of Alert, which is a sub-seasonal to semi-seasonal indicator platform that we're developing. Um, I'm Gina Charna there, and I want to also um, just thank and give recognition to all the co-authors that also work on the development of this uh, and are a key part of the work that I'm going to present here today. Um, so climate change um, has an impact to, is having a lot of impact everywhere in the world. Um, in Europe, we're seeing di direct impacts on health through heat related deaths and infrastructure damage, uh, and also direct injury due to storms and floods. Um, but as um, Kim just showed then, we're also seeing changes to infectious disease transmissions, such as shifting of vectors further north. They're changing, um, shifting of them to higher altitudes with increasing temperature. Um, and we're also seeing the emergence of pathogens in different areas due to global change in terms of people's behaviour and increased travel and trade. Um, Europe is potentially underprepared for some of these climate and health risks, um, mainly due to the fact that we haven't had to deal with some of them in the past or we haven't had to deal with them in a very long time. This creates um, an immunologically naive population um, and also a population that is potentially lacking in aggregate um, education and preparedness um, for these risks. And we basically need to be better prepared as a continent for, for some of these risks and some of how, how these risks might change in the future. Um, so I won't talk about Idealert because we've heard that already. Um, but basically there are two work packages that I'm going to touch on today. So the first um, one is work package two, which is the development of these indicators that um, Kim was talking about. Um, so it's developing indicators to monitor climate sensitive infectious disease risk and emergence. And then work package three is the seasonal indicator platform for target for a targeted early warning system and response for these indicators. Um, so the Barcelona Supercomputing Center is leading the co-creation of work package three, which is the sub-seasonal seasonal climate sensitive infectious disease indicator platform. And the aim is to provide an early warning forecast for climate sensitive infectious diseases in Europe for multiple end users, including scientists, medical professionals, humanitarian agencies, policymakers, and the general public too. Um, so there, so far we have three modeling approaches, um, which we aim to use, and we also aim to develop an ensemble as well to offer robust predictions, um, and also so that we can see differences among the modeling approaches, which often occurs with um, any modeling exercise, you get slightly different um, results depending on the approach that you take. Uh, in operation at the moment, we have a number of vector-borne and waterborne diseases that are considered at risk in Europe for transmission or emergence. So we have Lashmaniasis, malaria, tick-borne diseases, Vibrio, uh, West Nile virus, and Aedes-borne diseases as well, some of which um, Kim just presented them. Uh, and basically the idea of this is that if we can understand the relationships better between climate and meteorological variables and these climate sensitive infectious diseases, then we can make near term predictions for outbreaks and transmission using for short term climate forecasts. 
Um, so the data that we are using, so the integrators are predominantly being developed and validated in Work Package 2 using reanalysis data from ERA5 land at a 0.25 by 0.25 kilometer grid cell. Um, these models will then be used um, and linked to the subseasonal to seasonal climate predictions. Um, we also consider land use in this, which are really important for some of the vectors. Um, some of the vectors only like to breed or live in certain environments. Um, and again, we use the Copernicus um, Pyrene land classes for that. We're also looking at altitude um, from the EEA data, as we stated, um, some of the transmission we're expecting that transmission um, can occur at higher altitudes within increasing temperature, and we want to be able to track that. Um, and the Vibrio indicator is also looking at sea surface temperatures and salinity around the coastline so that we can better understand um, the risk around the coast for different species of Vibrio that can cause skin infections and ear infections and lots of um, very nasty infections. Um, so we are also considering um, inequity in this because it's not just the climate that impacts these diseases. There are also other things as well. So we're looking to stratify our results by different metrics of inequity so that we can understand if certain socioeconomic groups groups are more at risk. Um, and we're also looking at human mobility, population size, whether people live in an urban or a rural population, basically so we can better categorize who's at risk for these diseases and, and how these relationships with the environment vary um, across different populations and groups within that population. So the plat in the platform, we aim to offer summaries of the environmental variables, land use, travel and trade, and current outbreak information um, so that people basically can gain um, a good snapshot of what their risk is. So we've been looking, um, we've been developing lots of different ways basically to try and view this and what's going to be more um, suitable for the end user. So, so far, these are some of the graphics that we've been developing. So this isn't using projection data so far in the development stage. We're using the historical data for 2023 to kind of trial some of these different ways of viewing um, suitability. Um, so, so far we have suitability for AD the Gypti by month over the year, which is your left-hand panel. So the idea of this is so you can help identify areas which are more at risk, which is obviously really important for things like policy and also so that people know if they're living in an area that's high at risk. And then the graphic to the right is showing the proportion of people that live in a suitable grid cell in that country. So you could have um, lots of suitable areas in the country, but does anyone actually live in that area? And that's obviously really important for your policymakers. So they know like what portion of the population is actually at risk um, for transmission of this disease. So something else we want to look at is seasonality. So we're looking to define seasonality as basically how many continuous months are suitable um, for transmission and not just the number of suitable ones, but which months are suitable. Again, um, so that policymakers and health professionals know when the traditional season for transmission is likely to occur, when they're likely to see patients come into their clinic with these diseases. Um, and also so that we can see how that changes over time, which we're already starting to see in that some of these diseases are actually becoming less suitable in summer in Southern Europe because it becomes too hot and too dry for some of these vectors. So we're already seeing some of those changes. Um, and so the right panel, you can see the seasonality for um, two different genus of ticks. And then below basically is your environmental variables that have gone into building that model. So you can see why is it in season? Is it because the temperature has gone over a certain threshold or because of the precipitation has gone over a certain threshold? So again, that's particularly interested for sort of like scientists that want to track these changes and understand, you know, which climatic variables are making this um, vector or this disease more suitable in certain areas. So basically, we want to integrate all of this into a free open to use platform where you'll be able to select the pathogen that you're interested in and you'll get a little bit of information on that pathogen. Um, and then you can also click on specific areas so you can understand the suitability and seasonality for these different diseases um, in specific areas. And then also, as I said, include some additional information that might be helpful to the end user um, so that they can be better prepared um, as an individual and also as a healthcare system. And also to improve the transparency of how we're sort of coming up with these predictions and how we've quantified risks. Um, so the next steps, basically, we want to continue to develop new indicators. We want to strengthen the modeling framework um, that we're working on. All of this is still um, in development and is something that we're still continually working on. And also we're developing um, the platform. We're consulting with multiple different end users and we're looking at different ways to help um, present suitability and seasonality um, in the way that is the most useful for the people that we um, hope will use this platform in the end and find it helpful.
um that's kind of all I had to say I think eight and a half minutes so hopefully made up for <laughs> Kim running over slightly um and yeah I'm looking forward to any questions or discussion later on and thank you yeah very much for a fun time yeah thanks thanks very much and uh, you know that uh, that was a good wrap up of uh, what you're planning to do in uh, in ID Alert. I'm just wondering, um, are end users part of the project? So, in fact, that you are really co-developing something with uh, users or testing with you the users, and uh, so you're probably reaching out. To to really end users, or are you specifically reaching out to experts in some some field, some medical, some doctors, or something? Yeah, so um, Ideal, as Kim mentioned, is a very sort of like multidisciplinary consortium. So there's 19 organizations within that, and it isn't just sort of like people like you know myself. That's uh, you know climate health infectious disease modeler. Um, so some people are healthcare professionals. Some people are um, interested in, in things from the policy side. Um, so at the moment, where um, we're sort of mainly consulting like within BSC and our experts in different areas there and then consult within ID Alert. And then I think also the idea is that we can consult with also like the general public as well once we get a little bit further down the line. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's uh, luckily because it's within such a multidisciplinary project, um, it, it's already given us a lot of end users that we can consult with just within the project. And then obviously we can roll that out um, to more people once we get a little bit further down the line. Mm. Oh. If you if you would reach out to really to end users, it's probably also a question of uh, the language barrier that you have to overcome, uh, so that people uh, would simply not know. Uh, if you, for instance, if you go to Germany, well, there there would be rarely people understand all the what what kind of. Uh, um, uh, diseases you're talking about uh, because well they don't know the the English expressions uh, so if, if you really you're not going to get uh, to end users and I think we we will come to to this specific topic in a in a minute on our last speaker um, who's who is also challenging this this uh, this issue um, uh, then uh, you you need uh, this in in the local languages as well. Yeah, I think there is a plan to do that as well, because I think um, although this is Europe focused because ID Alert is a European Commission funded sure. project, um, the, the hope is that the platform will have a life after ID Alert is finished. We hope that obviously after five years, people won't just put it on the back burner and forget about it. So we do hope to roll this out globally um, when, the, when the project has ended. And obviously, with that being the case, it will be even more important to, to make sure that we offer it in multiple languages. So yeah, thanks thanks again, uh, Gina, uh, for this this quick overview uh, on ID Alert, and um, I think we uh, have to move to the our last speakers. Shuansu, uh, Shu, well, I'm not sure how to, to really pronounce your first mm -hmm. name uh, uh, right. Gao uh, for yeah. is uh, associated professor at Lund University in Sweden, uh, and uh, well, he is uh, working I think for quite some time also on. Uh, um, uh, human thermal environments, climate change and health, uh, and heat and cold stress and so on. And uh, within one project, he led, uh, there was a, a, um, an app which was developed um, to, and he will talk about this, uh, this application that you could later on, if you don't have it yet, uh, you can download and test it. It's for free, uh, and uh, it's about uh, translating climate service into personalized adaptation strategies to cope with thermal stress, the CLIM app, uh, and uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for your introduction, Andreas, and thank you for your invitation. Uh, yes, this is a, a product and a mobile phone app uh, developed based on the uh, earlier EU project. Um, so uh, on the top is the, I, I hope this is the uh, correct uh, screen. Yes, and the full title of the project is on the top of the screen. And uh, so I'm working at Nong University in Sweden. So we co coordinating this project and uh, with several other partners from other European countries. 
Uh, and the thermal stress here means, uh, so we cover both heat stress and cold stress. Uh, so I don't need to spend time to explain more climate changing and the global is warming up. And uh, so uh, the UN, United Nations launched the early warnings for all initiative. The initiative calls for the whole world to be covered by an early warning system. As we can see here is uh, uh, from uh, local, regional, national, and global. So in uh, from 2022, in next five years to 2027. So they call for this uh, coverage. And uh, as mentioned by early presentation, um, so we have different uh, vulnerable groups in the society. So for example, the outdoor workers and the elderly people and children, so they are vulnerable. So how to develop an uh, early warning system or climate service to target them um, is not for the general population. So we have some challenges, for example, on a threshold. And uh, the current heat wave warnings are mainly based on air temperature. This is a single climate variable, but then the impact of heat or cold on health depends not only on air temperature, but also on other factors. For example, humidity, mean radiant temperature, for example, if the sun is shining or we are staying in the shade. And the wind, wind is still or is blowing very fast. Individual factors, um, for example, age, uh, our body weight, and height, BMI, uh, our phys physical activity intensity, if we are doing heavy physical work, exercise, or if we are just sitting or standing, and the different types of clothing, because clothing is in between our body and the environment. So this will affect our heat exchange with the environment and our body heat balance and our uh, acclimatization to heat. If uh, we are acclimatized, we have better capacity to cope with heat. And um, so these are the individual factors. So we also need to take care of. And so climate concepts is to integrate and the weather forecast uh, data into human body heat balance models. So we combine all these factors and uh, to provide early warning, it is uh, both heat and cold uh, risk warnings and then also give recommendations. So what do we should do to reduce the risks? And uh, here is the main screen of the app. Uh, if you have installed and uh, tried an app, uh, so it uh, gives both the cold stress warning and heat stress warning. On the left hand side is for the cold, and the right hand side is uh, for the heat. And there is a bar here. So when this is moving towards the right hand side to the red area, it means the heat stress is increasing. If it's moving towards left side, then the cold stress is increasing. So this is a climb up index. So it's based on those factors. So we have a calculated integrated index. And on the top is the basic weather information and then we have uh, uh, recommendations in text and in uh, graphic advice. So this uh, will guide us what to do uh, if there is heat stress or cold stress. And uh, uh, this on the screens to show how do we personalize the app. So when we have uh, integrated personal factors, personal vulnerabilities, so we can personalize the, the heat or cold warnings. Uh, for example, activity level, we can uh, adjust 
according to your activity level, uh, whether it's low, mid, moderate, or high. And, uh, and individual factors, other factors, or your heat or climatization status, um, and closing, and we can input these factors and to personalize the early warning and recommendations. So it's not just a uh, uh, common weather forecast. So it's uh, based on air temperature and uh, uh, is a warning for everyone, for the whole society. So this is going uh, into personal level, individual level, give you more detailed information. Uh, so the app is uh, publicly available. It works uh, globally and uh, uh, there are 10 language versions, also some of the language versions we still need to improve. Uh, for example, um, in German, we still have some, uh, uh, we have found some issues. And then there are two versions for both Android and iPhone. So you can go to the Google Play Store or App Store to find Climap. You just search climb up so you can install it's free totally free as soon as app was awarded by an award meteorological organization in 2020 for originality and the innovation particularly in the personalization so you can personalize according to your situation and uh, uh, based on the climb up project and uh, we are participating in another uh, ongoing EU project. It's called uh, uh, High Horizons. Uh, and then we are developing another um, mobile phone app for maternal health and child health. Uh, for example, if uh, a woman is pregnant, so it's more vulnerable to heat, and how do we uh, provide warnings and recommendations for them. So this is why I ask in the threshold. So the threshold should be different. It's also a challenge uh, to find out, to identify the threshold for this group of uh, uh, vulnerable people. This is ongoing. Um, maybe next time I can present the details. I think I uh, stop here. Um, uh, thank you. Yeah, sure. And see, very thanks very much for this uh, this presentation and insight uh, um, of a climate service that uh, can really be used by say everybody uh, in, in the street. Uh, I wonder how you, can you tell me how many uh, users uh, are around, how many downloads, how many usages uh, you you presently have? It's it's always tricky of course to advertise a, 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 a program like this yes this is a, a product service uh, based on uh, an early eu project usually it's difficult to uh, maintain the operation uh, after the project end uh, but luckily because we have uh, we are participating in a new eu project is closely relevant to each other. So we are still maintaining the operation. Uh, at the moment, a few days ago, I checked for uh, both Android and uh, iOS version for iPhone. Uh, there are uh, more than 2,000 users for each of the version, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK, thank you. Other questions also to uh, the other presenters. We still have, say, five minutes or so to go. If uh, there are any uh, other questions you'd like to, um, to pose to our audience. Peter, I remember that you told me that you're also interacting with somebody from the uh, university hosp hospital uh, in your project. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, also, yeah. 
Yeah, um, we're just sitting next to each other. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, in the same room. Um, yeah, uh, at the moment we are actually um, uh, talking. Uh, like we have one researcher where we actually um, are closely related, like one of the experts on uh, climate change and health. But we are also in contact. Also, Ting and I are like with the like with different um like um, like medical scientists but also the sustainability manager of the facility so there's like another aspect which we haven't touched here is sort of like this like how like this mitigation and adaptation is also for healthcare a really an important issue because like for the healthcare provider like they are emitting co2 uh, like quite heavily because of the like if they if you say you want to cool down a hospital you you have uh like lots of uh yeah energy usage and at the same time they also need to adapt and because like if there is like going to be a strong heat wave they have to have the personal like like the the health staff needs to be there the like people need to like the rooms need to be cooled and so we are uh, currently in contact with them and in order to get their demands sort of like for for or needs for the climate services um, and to see if we can collaborate in other part like like in other projects it's not so much about like the uh, about the the health of the citizens but more about like how like like the the, the hospital like the healthcare system might be affected by climate change, which also has an impact, of course, <laughs> on the health of the citizen, but um, is, a, is sort of a bit of another topic, I would say. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think uh, Kim and uh, Gina, in, in ID Alert, you uh, have experts from the medical sector involved. Uh, was that correct when I, when I recall this? Um, yes. I'm. Most of us, I, I think, are probably with a biology, biomedical sciences background, and then a bunch of scientists that are from social scientists or climate scientists. And let's say, countdown in Europe, we also have an indicator that tracks greenhouse gas emissions from the healthcare sector specifically. So, if that's something of interest, Peter uh, I could connect with you on that. Um, and there's also uh, surveys that are being conducted in collaboration with the World Health Organization to. Uh, assess what different health systems require. So these are sent to different member states and then the country representatives indicate what the needs are of their local and national healthcare systems. So we have some information on that as well um, within Lesset Kaudan in Europe. And that feeds into IDLERT again as well. Don't know if you have something to contribute further to that, Gina. No, I think you've got it. <laughs> I wanted to ask a question about um, high horizons actually. I was wondering um, who the, I'm assuming the end user for that, like is pregnant women or, or moms or dads with small children. And I guess my question about it is, um, obviously it's something to be like, you're at risk, but is uh, what can people do with that information? Is there going to be something like that on the app or, or not? For example, um in in the app we are developing uh, we have recently discussed or oh, oh, it has been done for some time and the recommendations uh, message uh, have been co-developed with local users pregnant women health care workers and uh, uh, when they are facing the heat waves uh, what they are doing and uh, then we combine with uh, scientific uh, recommendations advice. Uh, so in what way we can, for example, one concrete example is uh, we should avoid the dehydration if we are sweating a lot. And then, then uh, we need to recommend uh, uh, the hydration strategies. So these are included in the uh, early warning system as uh, advice and to to avoid the dehydration. And also some uh, information about heat health risks, both for mothers and for the baby, uh, if they are hi hydrated or if their core temperature is increased, then blood flow will be more diverted to peripheral area of our body, of their body. And then uh, the blood flow going to the baby is reduced. 
then it will affect the uh, growth of, of the baby. Uh, so we have a um, uh, work package focused on epidemiological studies. They have found out, found out for example, preterm birth is most common when pregnant women have been uh, exposed to heat. So we want uh, to prevent and avoid those adverse those outcomes. Yeah, thank, thank you for this reply. We, we ha still have a question from, from Marta in the chat, but uh, I'm afraid we have to to uh, return to the, uh, to the main room and to close this session, at least we were advised to do so. Um, so uh, I would like to thank again all speakers uh, for your presentations. It was very insightful and uh, I learned quite a bit uh, ab about this topic. Um, and uh, uh, also to all uh, who attended uh, this session, and uh, I would like then uh, to to close this uh, the session for uh, and uh, um, you've uh, we have another webinar on a different platform which is coming up now, and uh, tomorrow we are uh, starting I think at nine thirty. It's right. Is that right, Ines? Yeah, nine nine thirty. 9.30 is the, we start again with uh, uh, another bunch of uh, breakout sessions, if I recall this correctly, right? Okay, so thanks again and, uh, and have a good evening and bye. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you all of you. Thank you for Thank your presentation. You.